The Montreal Canadiens truly the Zap Brannigan of NHL franchises, with an ego to match all of those Stanley Cups and the lack of self-awareness to match with all of their recent accomplishments, the Canadiens are entering this season with a glimmer of expectations and hope to finally get out of this three-year period of ineptitude and actually have that rebuild start to show that the sacrifice is worth it. So what does this year have in store for the Montreal Canadiens and their fans? I admit it. Last year was rough. The 2023-24 season actually started out pretty good for the Canadiens. They went 5-2-2 two two in the month of October, and despite losing Kirby Doc early on to an injury, looked like they were in a position to potentially be a scrappy out-of-nowhere club that could surprise some other teams. Then, the month of November came, in which the Canadiens lost 7 of 9 games to start the month, pushing them from 3 games above 500 to 2 games below it, and they basically hovered around 500 up until February, when they lost 7 of 8 games first putting the playoffs out of reach for them. As a result, the Canadiens unloaded what they could at the deadline, including a very smart move to ship off Sean Monaghan for a first round pick and Jake Allen for a conditional third in 2025. And when the dust all settled, the season ended with the Canadiens finishing in dead last in the Atlantic Division for the third straight year. And that three-year period that I mentioned where they finished at the bottom of the division, that was all helmed by this guy, Short King himself, Marty St. Louis. Now, despite the fact that the Canadians have finished at the bottom of the division every year that he's been the head coach, their fans are loath to hear any criticism of Marty whatsoever. And I do admit that he has done pretty well considering the circumstances. He took over a team that was not just at the bottom of the division, but at the bottom of the league and they have gotten better in terms of points every year that he has been the head coach. He did some good job developing players like Cole Caulfield, Nick Suzuki, and Yuri Slavkovsky. Having said all of that, the Canadiens did just extend St. Louis for another three years on his contract, despite the fact that he's never coached a team that has even come close to the playoffs. And I get that rebuilds take time, but this is year three of top five pick, including the number one overall pick, as well as adding plenty of ammunition in terms of prospects and picks over the last few years. The talent should be there in this organization, and the time has to be soon that the Canadians start at least being competitive and in the playoff hunt deep into the season. And saying that Marty, who remember, had no head coaching experience at any level before he took over the Canadiens, and who had been more competitive for the number one draft pick than for a playoff spot in his entire three-year tenure, is the guy that you want to hit your wagon to in the crucial years of this rebuild? It's a risk, that's all I'm saying. He could be the guy, but... I think there's a lot more evidence to suggest that he is not. You're a star! You're on top! Somebody bring you some hair! You should kill yourself! <gasps> you would think that it would be former number one overall pick Yuri Slavkovsky as the star player of this team, or Captain Nick Suzuki who led the team in points last year, but in truth, the best player on this team is undoubtedly Cole Caulfield. The point total may have been lower than Suzuki last year, and the year before that he missed a good chunk of time with injury, but the fact of the matter is that when Cole Caulfield is on the ice, he's one of the most efficient scorers that the Canadians have. He's been not just a positive career Corsi player for the Canadians, but above 54% in all four of his seasons, which is pretty spectacular considering how bad his teams have been. On a team full of very young, talented players, Caulfield is the one to me who stands out above the others right now, but somebody could easily have a career year and pass him. Oh, this guy again. And speaking of, two of those guys will probably be joining Caulfield on the first line. Center Nick Suzuki is the epitome of a two-way forward. Strong defensively, good instincts, has some offensive pop, and over the last few years he's been, quite frankly, shooting at a clip well over his pay grade, so don't be surprised if the goals maybe dry up as he regresses to the mean. Yuri Slavkovsky took last year to make me look like a dumbass for calling him a bust, which he's firmly out of that conversation right now with a 20-goal, 50-point year. Nothing spectacular, especially for a former number one overall pick, but there's room to grow, and with him needing a new contract, the Canadians could afford to be a little bit more conservative and- Okay, no, take back everything nice I just said. What the hell are you doing? I get the logic. You want to walk up your young top five pick just like those other teams did, and he had a good year last year, so why not pounce on it before he breaks out and creates an insane market for himself? Well, first of all, you're gambling not only that last year wasn't an aberration, but that he's going to continue to improve and eclipse his productivity from last year, and you're ignoring the fact that he also had one of the worst rookie years by a number one overall pick in the last 20 of years. His 82 game average over his career is 16 goals and 41 points. What if that is what he is and you're paying him $7.6 million for eight years on a contract that starts next season? 
I'm not saying that Slepkovsky can't live up to this contract or even that he won't. There is not only a chance that he does not live up to this salary, but this contract becomes an absolute albatross for the Canadiens. As much as he improved last year and took a step forward, he needs to take a big leap over the next two years to justify this salary. On the second line, along with the newly acquired Line A, we have Alex Newhook, the one young promising forward for the Canadiens that everybody seems to overlook and forget, even though he was pretty solid last year. Nothing spectacular, but if you put Slepkovsky on the back of his jersey, they're probably activity looks basically the same, except for the fact that yes, Newhook's a few years older. Christian Dvorak will be centering the third line, trying to convince Ken Hughes and everybody in the Montreal Canadiens office that he is still 23 and has oodles of potential instead of being a 27-year-old who has never eclipsed 40 points in his entire career. 2021 fifth-round pick Joshua Waugh is going to be getting a chance in the bottom six as well, after he had put up an impressive 32 points in 41 games in the AHL last year. The rest of the bottom six is littered with, quite honestly, players that the Canadiens will probably be looking to ship off at the deadline if they're not in playoff contention. Guys like Josh Anderson, even though nobody will take that contract, Jake Evans, Brendan Gallagher. Gallagher in particular will be a bit of a tough swallow for the Canadiens fans since he is the last remaining vestige of the Carey Price era, but you gotta let the past die at some point. On the back end, the first pairing will be the often underrated Mike Matheson and a young budding defenseman in Caden Cooley. Lane Hudson, a second round pick in 2022, is also going to be getting his first look in the big club. He'll be an interesting one to watch as a smooth puck carrying defenseman who can play on the power play. He'll be paired with the wily vet of the core in David Savard, who was only the worst defensive defenseman on the entire team last year. Arbor Jackai will be bringing the truculence on the bottom pair, and Justin Barron will be offsetting him. A little bit less truculence, but some solid stay-at-home play. In goal for the Habs, we have Sam Montebo, who Habs fans will continue to insist could be a really good goaltender once he reaches his potential even though he's 28 and has a career 899 save percentage. Sorry to tell you this, folks, but at age 28, I'm starting to think that he might just be a shitty goaltender. His backup, Caden Primo, is also not very good at 894 save percentage on his career, but at least he has the excuse of being 24, so he actually could get better. He was also pretty good for the Canadiens last year, a 910 save percentage, GAA under 3, which for this team is pretty unbelievable, and a pretty good goal saved above expected per 60 for a guy who only played in 23 games. Brit is in this? I may have ragged on Kent Hughes for giving that massive contract to Slavkovsky, but even I have to admit that he hit a home run when it came to that Patrick Line trade. I mean, how do you get Line, a guy who could be a 40 goal scorer at his peak, and a second round pick in exchange for Jordan Harris, who was, yes, a good, promising young defenseman, but nowhere near the level of Patrick Line, and who's kind of becoming excess goods with the development of Lane Hudson. Hughes also hit it out of the park when it came to the draft, where at pick number five, he made up for last year, passing on an elite Russian talent in Matvey Michkov by taking another elite Russian talent in Ivan Demidov. Because why have two young elite Russian prospects when you could only have one? One, and an overdrafted right-handed defenseman who might play for you in two years. I will be cursing out this franchise having to watch Matt Babichkov put up 80 points in his rookie year while hearing Habs fans talk about how David Ryback is going to be really good when he arrives in a few years. But they did make up for their mistake, took Demidov, who is a top five talent and could be one of the best forwards in this entire class. They'll have to wait a year, presumably, to get a look at him. But once he comes over here, he could easily slot into that top six. With their second first round pick of the day, they took Michael Haig at a Chicago Steel, a very solid pick for a guy who I didn't think was going to slip out of the top 20. And after those two, the only other notable pick was taking Atos Koivu, son of Saku Koivu, at pick number 70. Is he any good? Who cares? We need the nostalgia, baby. That's not bad. Of all the young players that the Canadians have on their team, the one guy I'm really rooting for, honestly, is Kirby Doc. He had such a rough go of it last year, only getting to play in two years before suffering a season-ending injury. It'd be an amazing story for him to come back from that injury and prove that he was worth being the third overall pick. It's gotta be tough already having been traded by the team who drafted him, and he showed some flashes of promise in his first year with Montreal, putting up 38 points in 58 games. The Gambletron 2000 says the winner is... Cincinnati by 200 points! Why you? Junk. With the line A trade, you could say that the Montreal Canadiens have one of the better sneaky good top six forward cores in the entire NHL. I mean, I think you would be wrong to say that, but you could. Not completely insane. On the bottom six, I'd say that they're ready weak. Like, not terrible, but definitely towards the bottom end of third and fourth line combos among NHL teams. It's on the back end and between the pipes where I really start to have problems with the Canadiens. When Mike Matheson's your number one defenseman, you are in trouble. When Sam Montebo is your starting goaltender, you are completely fucked. 
Best case scenario is that Caden Primo really takes a jump in net. See a young goaltender in the minors like Jacob Doze just comes out of nowhere and pushes into the starting position. And on the back end, you're really putting a lot of hope that Lane Hudson is going to be that guy really early on. And the other big problem that we haven't touched on is the fact that that Atlantic division is just so stacked. Even the bad teams like the Senators and the Sabres got better this offseason and teams like the Panthers, the Bruins, the Leafs are just not going anywhere. Unfortunately, I think this is another year where the Canadians finish at the bottom of the division. One, I'm a Bruins fan. Two, they had the rights to everyone from Quebec back in the day, so unfair advantage. Three, I'm a Bruins fan of oh, four. They brag about Suzuki, Caulfield, Slav, and Demidov way too much. Five, I'm a Bruins fan six. They act like their championships weren't easy. Like, bro, there was six teams. The fans always brag about all their past championships back when the league was less competitive and smaller, meaning a greater chance of them winning the cups to begin with. It's ridiculous to hold on the things that old. Reminds me of a 40-year-old still talking about their high school peaking days.